Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted and privileged to welcome a very accomplished and respected author from Baltimore, Maryland, USA, Mr. Mark Gober. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Mark is uh, an author and a podcast host. He's an author of several books, uh, An End to Upside Down Thinking, An End to Upside Down Living, An End to Upside Down Liberty, An End to Upside Down Contact. He's the host of a podcast titled Where Is My Mind? And he has been a board member of the Apollo 14 astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell's Institute of Noetic Sciences and the School of Wholesome, Wholeness and Enlightenment. My God, you seem to be doing some really fun stuff, Mark. Hmm. But let's start with asking you a question. You have written on very diverse subject under a common line and end to upside down. From consciousness to government to aliens. Tell me about your books and why this unique title. Hmm. Well, my background is in business. Mm -hmm. I used to work in investment banking in New York, and then I worked at a Silicon Valley-based strategy firm advising tech companies. Mm -hmm. So I had a very traditional way of looking at the world. I was focused on worldly accomplishments, mm -hmm. uh, advancing my career. And in 2016, so about six years ago, while I was working at my firm, before I had become a partner, mm -hmm. um, I was listening to podcasts actually, and started to hear about the topic of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it changed my worldview dramatically because then I started to read books and realized I had to, there was a lot that I didn't know about mm -hmm. life. And my the basic worldview was as follows, that I used to think that life was fundamentally random and meaningless mm -hmm. and that we could try to make up meaning in our life, but mm -hmm. that's just a rationalization. When the body dies, that's the end of consciousness. That's the end of awareness. And uh, it was kind of a bleak outlook. Correct. And then in 2016, I was coming across scientific evidence mm. that was challenging that worldview. So my worldview was turned upside down. Um, at the time, I didn't know I was going to be writing books. Mm. But a year later, I wrote the first book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, on the idea of consciousness mm -hmm. uh, beyond the brain and the idea that consciousness is the fundamental Yep. substrate of reality, a mm. uh, very non-dual idea, which has become my metaphysics. Correct. But then I didn't I didn't stop there because then I realized there was more about life that mm. was upside down. And that's mm. what's that that's the theme. Mm. Fascinating. I I hope you visited uh, visited us in India because non-duality or advait is something which has been here for thousands of years and consciousness is a very important part of all our lives. Delighted to be uh, able to talk to you about this. Uh, so, you know, when you started to talk about consciousness uh, and started to start thinking about your books, uh, did you go and do a lot of research uh, into the subject? Because from an investment banker to a, to, to a tech advisor now to consciousness, you know, somehow there's a, you know, these are completely opposite to one another. Yes. The, the actual subject matter is different, mm -hmm. but the approach to research is actually something I did back when I was an undergrad at Princeton. I had to write a thesis, so I was accustomed to having to pull together information. Mm -hmm. And then especially in my, in my tech job, because I was responsible for advising management teams and boards of directors, along with my colleagues, mm -hmm. on complex technology and intellectual property issues, mm -hmm. patented technologies. So I had to learn about diverse technologies from the inventors, very technical stuff, mm -hmm. and then simplify it and bring it to the management team or the board of directors. So when I was studying consciousness, it was just like a different subject matter, but I took the same approach of reading everything I could, listening to the opposing points of view. When I did my podcast series, I actually started to interview the people myself, mm -hmm. but with the internet, you can listen to interviews from many scientists yeah. and read their work. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Oh, interesting. So let me now move to your book and end to upside down contact, UFOs, aliens, and spirits, and why their ongoing interaction with human civilization matters. You know, the, the entire topic of aliens and outer space has fascinated humanity from time immemorial. What is the basis for you to so emphatically say that aliens exist? <laughs> well, the way that I, I frame the book mm. is that 
that humans are not alone. So that non-human intelligences exist, whether we call them aliens or spirits or you know anything. There are different names that cultures have used, mm. and like you you allude to, this is an ancient phenomenon. Okay. Even back in some of the the ancient uh, Vedic literature, they talk about vimanas, mm. these flying crafts. Yep. But it's not, it, but there are cultures all over the world that talk about interactions with beings, the sky gods. Uh, but then if we go to more modern times, people have near-death experiences. Their brain is off, and yet their consciousness is very active, mm. and they encounter beings. Uh, on psychedelics, mm. people are, in, you know, they take certain substances, they go to other dimensions, they encounter other beings. Mm. So what I do in the book is look at all these different cases, whether it's related to a UFO craft or to some phenomenon of consciousness, mm. there's a common theme that we're not alone. So that's what I try to explore. Mm. And... Uh... When you interact with people about this entire concept of um, spirits um, or life after um, mm -hmm. or rebirth, uh, and I'm now using terms that we have grown up listening to in India, what is the general reaction of the of the scientific community to a world that you have belonged to? There's a lot of resistance generally. There are some people that are more open-minded than others, but what I'm describing challenges the mainstream Western paradigm in science, which says that all of those things you're describing are impossible because of what we know about physics and what we know about the brain, they would say. But there's an entire body of science, which is often suppressed, unfortunately, it's peer reviewed scientific papers, the University of Virginia studying over 2,500 cases of young children with memories of a previous life. Okay. Uh, the United States government running two decades plus of studies using psychic spies and their declassified documents. There's just a whole body of evidence that most people haven't been exposed to. Mm -hmm. So the people's reaction to me typically depends on how far they're willing to go to actually look at the evidence. Fascinating. And for my viewers and listeners, Mark, Tell me a little more about how do we know we are not alone? Well, the challenge here is that often we have to rely on other people's experiences. Correct. Because the direct evidence, sometimes I talk about some of the physical evidence of actual implants that people report, but even cases like that are difficult to actually tie to a non-human intelligence. Mm -hmm. But when you have very bizarre cases appearing throughout time throughout cultures all over the world and people like for uh, example john mack former head of psychiatry at harvard mm -hmm. a pulitzer prize winner so as credible as you can get wow. late mm -hmm. in his career he examined cases of people believe it or not who claimed they were abducted by some of these intelligences and he concluded as a psychiatrist that these people were not psychotic mm -hmm. and he wrote two very elaborate books on the on the matter mm -hmm. so what i would say as someone who's researched it is that these details seem to appear in disparate cases and if you take the time to look at the evidence i don't think we know exactly what's going on but something strange is happening mm, interesting so you know someone used to ask me a question or maybe i used to ask my parents this question you know there is a soul which when we die goes away i said is there someone who manages the inventory of souls it's a I great question. Yeah, it's one that I've explored as well because okay. it, implicit in the reincarnation process is an intelligence that's managing it. Mm. And how does one account for karma? Who's actually monitoring that? Okay. Um, from the strictly non-dual perspective, some of the ideas I've heard is that all the intelligence is built into this field of consciousness that mm. is the basis of reality. Mm. But there appear to be beings involved. So I do talk about this in the contact book. The notion of between lives mm -hmm. intelligence. So mm -hmm. sometimes when people are taken back through hypnosis to their alleged past lives, they talk about a period between lives. And even the children with past life memories studied at the University of Virginia and elsewhere, mm -hmm. they talk about a period between lives. Mm -hmm. So they haven't incarnated yet, but their consciousness is still aware. And they do talk about other intelligences that are there guiding them sometimes. Um, in many cases in the near-death experience. So this is when a person is act, they're resuscitated, so they don't actually die, but maybe they had cardiac arrest where they almost died and their consciousness experienced other beings and they had a life review, people often report. They relive their whole life. 
in a flash and they get to experience what it was like to be the person that they impacted. But I mention this because sometimes there's a being there some spiritual entity that is seemingly guiding the process. Mm. So what I gather from all these accounts is that there are intelligences involved. I don't understand it, but there, there seems to be a hierarchy of beings. Very interesting. So what, what I'm hearing you say is one is the consciousness of us as human beings, and there could be another set of people living on other, on other planets, which are uh, extraterrestrials. Or is there could also be a possibility we are going and living on some of the other uh, planets? Absolutely. That's what the research seemed to suggest. And also that some of these intelligences exist in other dimensions. So you could have multidimensional beings, interplanetary beings, and beyond. Mm. And um, to tie this to the topic of consciousness and past lives, this was one of the first things I learned maybe six years ago that when people are taken through hypnosis to past lives, sometimes they spontaneously will talk about a life not on this planet, Mm. meaning that they lived on another planet and they were not a human, meaning they were some some other kind of biological being. Mm. And there's a woman named Dr. Linda Bachman, who was a traditional psychologist. Then she had a very strange experience with a deceased colleague. She became very spiritual and then worked with people on past life regression hypnosis. Mm. And to her surprise, she was not interested in aliens. Her clients spontaneously started talking about lives not on earth. So that's one example. You know, it, she calls them interplanetary souls. But then there is there was a study done. It's called the Free Study, uh, led by Ray Hernandez, Rudy Shield from the Harvard Smithsonian Institute. So some very credible people. And they aggregated over 3,000 accounts of people who had co- alleged to have contact with non human intelligences, including things like UFO related phenomena. And they track the types of beings that people report. And sometimes they report reptilian beings that they encountered, sometimes what they call gray aliens, sometimes insectoid beings, very bizarre things. But sometimes with psychedelics, people report this too. And when John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist studied it, this is what he was hearing from people as well. So it's like a, I I call it in the book, a Venn diagram, the circles overlap from these disparate areas yeah. and it just makes you wonder i can't prove it but mm. why are people saying these very bizarre details mm. in the same way very interesting and of course uh, then there's this other aspect of the ufos the unidentified flying objects um and it's you know often said that in the us particularly there have been a lot of sightings mm-hmm. uh, i'd love to get your perspective on ufos and it's also said that there is some very secret place in the U.S. where there are uh, UFOs st- stored and they're researching. Yes. So this is something I do look at in the book, An End to Upside Down Contact. And the way I think about it is I wouldn't stake my case on any individual sighting, hmm. but it's the accumulation of sightings, hmm. even some of which that happened before we had aircraft technology, pre 1900 sightings that exist. The researcher Richard Dolan has written some amazing books on the history of UFOs. These are extremely like thick history books. And when you read case after case, it starts to become compelling. But at the same time, I would say that not every sighting is real. There are other explanations for things we see in the sky, especially with drones Mm -hmm. and complex government crafts. Some of it might be human, but some of it seems to be very strange. Mm. Now to your question about secret government programs, my overall sense is that a lot is being hidden from the public. Now, what exactly that is, it's hard to discern, but there are some government documents that talk about the way in which, so for example, the Robertson panel in 1952, this is a, just a piece of history yeah. where there was a desire to try to basically make the UFO phenomenon seem like it was crazy. Mm. Um, there, there are events like this in history where the full truth has not been disclosed. Right. Very interesting. And, uh Again, based on a lot of your research, is there a group of you know experts like you who are experiencing ongoing interaction with another uh, set of beings? I have talked to some people that do have these ongoing interactions mm-hmm. and listened to many interviews and researched people that have had these experiences. M- me as an individual, I've not had those experiences mm-hmm. that I can recall. And I say that I use this term that I can recall because in many of the accounts with non-human intelligences, especially related to UFOs, Mm. people talk about missing time. Mm. 
So there's some ability of these beings. It's a consistent theme that they can manipulate consciousness. They can actually alter memories. Mm. So it's possible that some of us have had experiences and simply don't have the memory, mm. but there are other people who do have the memory. And that's what I try to focus on. Mm. And people who do have the memory, um, are we being able to catalog a lot of these memories and correlate their experiences with something that may have actually happened in their lives? Yeah, there are researchers that try to do this. And some of the examples, again, this is more difficult to mm. prove sometimes because there might be a UFO sighting and then the person saw a bright light outside their bedroom and then there's missing time. Mm. There are examples like that. Then they wake up and they, they feel restless, mm. but you can't account for what happened in the middle. I mentioned implants, that there have actually been surgical removals mm. of implants in the body, not many cases of it, but because it's hard to get funding to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But why were the implants there? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it can be correlated potentially with a UFO sighting, um, more difficult to prove. Mm -hmm. Also cases of phantom pregnancies, mm -hmm. women who are pregnant and it's not correlated with a sexual encounter, even women who are who are lesbians, for example, they haven't had a sexual encounter with men. Mm -hmm. They have a pregnancy then the pregnancy disappears. This mm -hmm. was John Mack from Harvard. Mm -hmm. He talked about this hybridization program that people allege. Mm -hmm. um, so there are these cases people try to correlate, but it has not been done definitively. Fascinating. And again, for my viewers and listeners, can you give us one or two more interesting examples like these? Okay. So in the book on contact, I talk about a case. Um, it's in Australia. Mm -hmm where a researcher actually used forensic DNA analysis mm -hmm. to analyze hairs that were left over from an alleged encounter with beings wow. that, that disappeared. Mm -hmm. So this guy had leftover evidence and they found very strange properties in these hair in the hair analysis because mm. the DNA seemed to have been grafted the nature the hair color and the color skin color of the being didn't correlate with the DNA they would have expected mm. now there aren't too many of these cases because number 1 the the physical evidence is sparse okay. but also in order to get the funding you need someone who's going to spend all the time to do this mm. kind of forensic analysis. But when it has been done, like in this case, mm. uh, there's a book by Bill Chalker called Hair of the Alien, where he goes mm. through the analysis that they did mm. on this hair. That's pretty powerful if we can get more of those cases. Mm. Fascinating. I now let me ask you a question, which um, it, I don't know if it's hypothetical or whether um, it is something which I'm trying to visualize. But We've often read books and then we've, the famous book Clash of Civilizations has often, has often been talked about. In a world that is so parochial that we live in today, how do you see a battle of civilizations taking place between interstellar bodies? I mean, do you really think, see something like that happening? I think it's very possible. And there are many ancient we call them myths or stories about the past that are, are regarded as fiction. Mm. But I start to wonder more and more if those ancient stories are just descriptive of what they saw, that there were intelligent beings that were battling. Now, to me, it could also be occurring on a multidimensional level. So we don't always see it with our eyes, but because the way I view the brain is that it's, it's almost like an antenna or a filtering mechanism that's mm. picking up stuff. Mm. And we might be influenced by these forces all the time. So there could be an interdimensional, even maybe intergalactic battle that people have talked about, but it might be manifesting through this planet and that we are instruments of that as well. Very, very interesting. So uh, let me now move uh, to your podcast. Where is my mind? Tell me a little bit about your podcast and what are some of the areas that you uh, cover in your podcast? So it's not a traditional podcast in that it's not like this, where it's a half hour of, of just two people talking. Mm -hmm. I interviewed dozens of scientists and experiencers on the topic of consciousness. Wow. And I worked with a production company where there are eight episodes and the whole show is a conversation between me and my producer, who I knew from high school. So I've known him for a long time, but he works in the media industry. Mm -hmm. And we take clips of the interviews. Mm -hmm. So we talk about, for example, remote viewing, which is the ability for consciousness to be somewhere at a distance in space and time. Mm -hmm. So to psychically see something far away. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed many scientists. I interviewed people at the US government's program who did this. Mm -hmm. And it, there's those clips are spliced in to the episodes. Okay. So we, we cover many topics of consciousness and mm -hmm. this idea of 
consciousness beyond the brain, non-duality effectively, uh, telepathic abilities, so mind-to-mind communication, near-death experiences, the research at the University of Virginia on children with past life memories. Mm. Also, we talked to uh, researchers on the topic of mediumship, which is the ability to communicate with the deceased Mm. and certain controlled studies, five levels of blinding Mm. with mediums to show that they actually get information. Mm. And we cover all those topics to challenge the conventional Western view of consciousness. Amazing. And again, for my viewers and listeners, how do you define consciousness? Well, one of the big challenges is that it's not a physical thing that I can point to. So, um, And from the non-dual perspective, it is everything. And therefore, to use language restricts what it is. So Mm. language is an approximation. And I I give that caveat before giving my definition. Mm. I view consciousness as the part of us that experiences ultimately our Mm. subjective inner awareness. When I say to you that I am speaking, that that sense of I is consciousness, but Consciousness is not even the thought because the thought that we have or thoughts in our mind are registered by consciousness. Mm. So it is the the meta part of us that has all experience. Very interesting. And, you know, I was speaking to somebody else the other day and we got talking about consciousness and uh, this person was an expert in artificial intelligence. And they were saying that we won't really be able to take uh, artificial intelligence to a level where it is smarter than human beings. So I said, does that mean that our consciousness will get modified? And does that mean that now our artificial intelligence or our metaverse uh, will become equal to our aliens? Mm. What are your thoughts? It's a very important topic. The way I look at artificial intelligence, if we regard it as just machines, Mm. so not biological, then because to me, consciousness is not derived from anything physical, it mm. precedes the physical, mm. then the biological, the machine intelligence, so just basically a big computer mm. could be very intelligent, but it won't have the sense of awareness. It won't have the capacity to actually experience. It will just be a complex computer. Mm. That said, biological entities like human beings can become vessels for consciousness. So I do wonder, could you create a biological vessel that can somehow receive consciousness? Mm -hmm. That might be possible, but it wouldn't be the generator of consciousness. Mm -hmm. It would just be a new vessel for Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, along with consciousness, there is also this other aspect of emotions, which we... uh, you know, experience as human beings and as a part of our consciousness. What happens to some of these, uh, you know, uh, features that each one of us as human beings uh, when our consciousness leaves us? Well, what appears to be the case is that the there are aspects of the personality that continue after the physical body dies. Mm-hmm. And I point to the near-death experience as one case because in those instances, the person is usually in a physiological state of trauma, Mm. like their brain might be turned off, cardiac arrest, Mm. and yet their consciousness is hovering over their body. Sometimes they see things in the room from above their body, which are validated when they're back in their body. But in that process, it still feels like it's them to some degree. Also with the children who have previous life memories studied at the University of Virginia, the children in their current life might have fears or things that they actually desire or prefer that correlate to what they preferred or feared in the previous life. Mm. So there's an aspect of continuation of not only the consciousness, but parts of the personality from one life to the next. That's what seems to be the case. Amazing. So now coming to my last question for you, and you know, it's just one of the most incredible conversations I've had in a long time. Uh, and this question, Mark, is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Based on your amazing journey, uh, you know, from an investment banker to a tech guru to now an author and focused so heavily on consciousness, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your journey and our conversation? Okay. The first one goes back to the near-death experience. And Mm -hmm. I want to talk about one of the phenomena that is reported. People have a life review. They literally become the people that they impacted and they live their whole life in that period. And what they often say is that the little things are the big things. 
That's what they experience in the life review, how yeah. they treated the cashier in line. So the little things are the big things because that's what seems to be built into the nature of reality itself. Yeah. Number two is I, I talk about this in my second book and end upside down living. Mm -hmm. It's really important to have a compass for what we intend to do with our life. Mm -hmm. It's a very big idea. Like what's the overall intention of one's life, mm -hmm. but getting an answer to that question is really important because it drives all of our values and our priorities. Yeah. And for me, the third would be just having a sense of curiosity about our existence and yeah. acknowledging with a sense of intellectual humility that our brain limits what we experience. There's so much that we don't know. And there's a lot that we can't even comprehend, which should make us open-minded. Mm, fantastic. Mark, on that note and your three amazing lessons, little things are big things. What we do with our life is very important for us to understand. And we must always have a sense of curiosity about our existence. Um, and of course, uh, my request to all my viewers and listeners to go and check out um, all of Mark's books uh, and into the Upside Down series that he has written. And I'm going to certainly go and look out for your book on consciousness and uh, your latest book. Thank you again for speaking to me about your books, about your journey, about so many different experiences, about consciousness. And uh, good luck to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for The Brand Called You.